major support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Allah Israel, all people, no limits. Hello and welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Siler. Our meeting's off today. Uh, before we begin our interesting program, uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services for, uh, for funding and sponsoring Able Than On Air. Uh, with us to discuss homelessness, the problems of homelessness in Vermont, and uh, and uh, also we profile Judy Joy and her accomplishments. We would like to welcome Judy Joy, resident manager of Green, of of, um, of uh, Good Samaritan Haven of Barry, Vermont, and your name, please, Heather Tolman. Uh, program manager of um, Good Samaritan Haven of um, Barry, Vermont. Welcome to Able Then On Air. Thank you. And uh, Judy, um, before we begin, uh, since we're kind of profiling you, um, how did you get started in homelessness services? I understand it's Washington, well, D.C. <laughs> way back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, I was recently married in um, 85, December of 85, and um, my husband and I were working in a school for multiply handicapped and emotionally disturbed, disturbed children. And we both loved our jobs, but we, I saw a sign in my church about Lutheran Volunteer Corps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with Lutheran, Vol Lutheran Volunteer Corps. And you make a a one-year commitment to social justice, simplified lifestyle, and Christian community. And then you have a lifetime to live it out. So we went, we got accepted, and we went to Washington, D.C. in August of 1986. And um, I worked in a uh, transitional shelter for um, homeless women who needed extra support, had moved beyond the shelter, but needed extra support. And I was there a year. And when our service year ended, we didn't really want to stop doing that work. So I got the job as the shelter manager of Luther Place's Night Shelter, which was in a, Washington, in D. Washington, D.C., at Thomas Circle, mm -hmm. which was a shelter for homeless women, and we had 37 beds. And um, I did that until 1980, ni 1990, when we decided to hike the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. So we did that and then went back to the shelter, and in 1992, moved to Maine mm -hmm. to, um, to run a shelter for men, women, and families. Is it since we're talking about homelessness, um, and then we'll get to program uh, stuff, is it is it um, being that it's a loving career, and you don't get compensated for a lot of things that people do? Um, is it hard to run a shelter, um, as far as like you know, because? People are sometimes stubborn, or they don't want to go into a shelter and get help. Is it really hard to run a shelter? It, well, it's, it's not hard for me because I absolutely love doing it. It has its hard parts. And for me, the hardest part is seeing how difficult life is for homeless people mm -hmm. and how they have to struggle. Even in the shelter, it's hard. Um, when I was an LVC member, Christian community mm -hmm. was the hardest part. Social justice we did through our work, simplified lifestyle we did because we didn't have any money, 
but the Christian community part was really hard. Mm -hmm. And that was only seven other people. The shelters were all big. The one in DC, an urban shelter, had 37 beds. The one in Maine was a very rural shelter. Mm -hmm. The number of beds changed a lot depending on what, needed, what was needed for families. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a set number of women's beds and a set number of men's beds, but the families were constantly in flux. Mm. And we could add beds or bunks or cribs or whatever. Babies, too? Oh, wait, there were babies. There were, I almost always did my work with a baby on my lap. I kind of missed that. Mm. That was really cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a little play area in my office, and kids would come in, and uh, that was really fun. Mm. Um, it was really sad seeing how they got there, but it was really gratifying to help the families move through and you know become become housed. And um, is it more difficult for children than adults? The children were always happy. So you made especially happy. the little ones were always happy. Because you made them happy. The yeah. teenagers not so happy. It was hard for them because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people knew they lived at the shelter and stuff like that. Or say their school, which is right up the hill, did like some kind of big drive for food. And people would bring the food, but they would know it was their class. That was difficult for them. Mm -hmm. But the shelter in Barrie, Good Samaritan Haven, mm -hmm. has 30 beds. So everybody's living with 29 other people. That's got to be really hard. Don't you think that's got to be really, really difficult? Since you say difficulty, um, you know, there's a difference, and you can both answer this, there's a difference between homeless, like chronic homelessness, and displacement. There is, is a difference. What is the difference? Define if you can. So the difference, uh, chronic homelessness is having at least four episodes of homelessness within a three year period. Um, and then displaced is if you've been living somewhere and you are couch surfing, um, you no longer have your apartment, but you're able to stay with folks and you may just need the homeless um, option, the Good Samaritan Haven, you may need that just briefly. But chronic homelessness is a series of um, periods of actual homelessness over a duration of time. But okay. displaced is losing your apartment, um, having a fight with your ex, or, or, or having a, d a divorce and having needing somewhere to stay before you do find stable housing. That's displaced. Uh, but chronic homelessness is several periods over a certain duration of time. Mm -hmm. Um, now, with homelessness, are people like stubborn or oh, I don't want help or are they too prideful? What have you been finding being the fact that you've worked in, in this field for so many years? I, I don't think that it's a, a negative thing for mm. people to we be homeless. We want to kind of break barriers here as well, yeah. negative and positive. Go ahead. But I think people sometimes feel that there's negativity surrounding them when they're homeless and it affects their mental health, it affects their physical health. So at Good Samaritan Haven, we try to help with any of those things that have caused the homelessness that are the results of being homeless. We have a, a counselor connected with Washington County Mental Health who will see people set them up with um, case management services, things like that. We have a housing counselor who helps people look for housing, which is really difficult because there's not enough affordable housing, which Why is really is exacerbating the homeless say, issue. Okay, since you say Vermont, and, and we might go a little bit over, which is fine, because it's an extremely important issue. How, uh, this past week, uh, or this past, <coughs> this <coughs> the state house mm. in Vermont had a advocacy day for homelessness. Explain about that, why that was, and what's the ma main problem in Vermont as far as 
homelessness population? I would say that the, the, the vigil and the awareness was to bring attention to the fact that there is a lack of affordable housing um, for mm -hmm. Vermonters, and they brought it to the State House to bring political attention to the fact that this is an actual crisis for a lot of folks, not just our under-housed or not housed individuals, um, but it brought attention to the fact that there has to be something that has to be done, um, and it's not just hearsay, it's not just roundtable conversations anymore, it needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed at the political the political level, uh, and no longer the community partners, the housing developers, the landlords. It needs to actually, we need to come up with a concrete solution. Yeah, the, 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 the new housing development on Taylor Street, for example, that's only one small smidgen. You have 30 apartments there, right? And then down the street in, certain, uh, in Pioneer Apartments, for example, there's 60 apartments. So you're only covering a small smidgen of helping people. So what's the big problem in homelessness? <clears throat> well, I think part of it is just not being able to afford mm -hmm. to get into an apartment. The, the security deposits and the first month's rent and the last month's rent and thing like, things like that most of our folks are earning minimum wage. Mm -hmm. There's many people <clears throat> who live paycheck to paycheck because mm -hmm. most of their money goes to their housing. So if their car breaks down, they're stuck. They can't get <coughs> to work. They'll lose their housing. If, say, someone has a mental breakdown and has to be hospitalized, their Social Security stops for a period of time. They lose their place. Your Social Security just, will stop if you're hospitalized? It, it can. If it's a, a longer period of time, mm -hmm. it can stop. Or if you're incarcerated, mm. it will stop. And then Because landlords won't really deal with incarcerated people, correct? Well, but you could, be ha you could have your own place. But then through something, it might not even be your own fault, you become incarcerated. The court system moves very slowly. Mm -hmm. So you might be in there for a month or two or three. Your social security will stop. Your landlord's not gonna hold your apartment waiting for you to get out of jail and pay all your back money. So you'll lose it and trying to find another apartment at these market rates or even with a voucher is really difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have people who have vouchers mm -hmm that are having trouble finding apartments. We, and we're trying to utilize things like social media, our, our Facebook posts to try to drum up some attention with local landlords. Um, I actually sat with a gentleman yesterday to try to um, look for apartments because he has the money to find an apartment. There were four apartments in his price range. Um, out of the four, two have already been um, spoken for, so they were no longer available, and we were able to <coughs> obtain an application for the second one, but the third one wouldn't call us back, and I think that's because I verbalized that I was calling from the Good Samaritan Haven. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of stigma out there also yes. um, with some, some property managers and some landlords wanting to rent um, to our um, unhoused individuals. Since you said that, why is there and what is the stigma that people... Um, see out there for, especially landlords, <clears throat> that see out there uh, in terms of being housed? I would say I would think that in the past uh, for some landlords they may have rented to some folks that may have um, not been good tenants. Um, but going forward, we actually are implementing at Good Samaritan Haven and all of our homeless shelters life skills um, that will teach them how to budget, teach them how to um, communicate effectively with individuals. Um, so we're trying to resolve those issues. But I think in the past, individuals that have rented mm -hmm. um, that may had a bit, may have been transitioning from Good Samaritan Haven into stable housing might have made bad choices. Uh, or and so maybe it's kind they, of, might not ha they might not have landlord you know, references. Mm -hmm. Or they might not have the skills to right. live independently. Yep. And we're working on all those things. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Elizabeth at the shelter, our peer support person, focus, her job is to help people learn how to take care of their space. Mm -hmm. And we can give them 
we can give people a reference based on how they've maintained their area, how helpful they've been in the house, things like that. We can give those references and we'll support people once they move on um, in staying connected with them and making sure that they are able to, to function in their own place as much as we can mm -hmm. time among the time constraints. How long is the time constraint that they have? Because I know it's um, I know it's changed over the years. Or well, it's a 90-day program now. Um, 90 days. And, and we're Three hoping, months. Three months. we're hoping it to be, and this, when I was in D.C., my minister, it was a, uh, the shelter was in a church, mm -hmm. and my minister <clears throat> started saying that we, we were a continuum from homelessness to independence. And then Henry Cisneros, who was head of housing and urban development, came to visit the shelter frequently, and he sort of adopted that, a continuum of care from homelessness to independence. And that's really what we're focusing on still, even though HUD adopted our, our little uh, buzz sentence. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're trying to work on, to get people from not being housed to being housed, it's not a fast process. Mm -hmm. Some people, if they come in and they already have a voucher, might be quick. If someone comes in needing it from the ground up, needing their ID, needing their Social Security, needing whatever it is they need, help with finding a job, any of those things, it's not a quick process. So if someone comes off the ground running and goes to appointments and does things, they'll get out quicker? They will get out much more quickly. Mm -hmm. they, if, they, if they are doing what they need to do to move on, then they will get out much more quickly. Okay. Maybe not within 90 days, though, because of the housing market. Just so hard mm -hmm. to find a place. Since you said uh, program director, what exactly do you do? Oh, program director. Uh, so currently I am trying to do a lot of outreach. Um, I work collaboratively with the Department of Labor, Voc Rehab, um, Capstone, to try to bring in folks and individuals that will educate uh, our current population. Um, either that be, last week we had um, Margaret Ferguson from Capstone come in and she uh, instructed our folks on how to build uh, financial muscle and what that would look like. How do you budget on a budget? Um, how do you prepare meals under a certain amount of money? Um, so we're trying to educate. I'm trying to bring in programmatic stuff in the form of um, education for folks. They may not have gotten these skills prior to entering the Good Samaritan Haven, mm -hmm. but we really want to ensure that when they're getting part of the transition is giving them information that they potentially don't have. Um, so programmatically, I'm focusing on that. Um, I want to focus on repairing our relationships or building relationships with property managers, uh, with landlords, trying to um, uh, dissolve some of the bias out there of the population that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my focus. <clears throat> I do um, some grant stuff. I do reporting um, numbers and stuff like that. But mine is to meet with our guests to make sure um, that when they enter, they, are, they go through a individual service plan process. Um, I'm trying to implement that at 60 days we touch base with them to see what have what sort of strategies have been successful, what are some of their accomplishments, and talk about what can we do in the next 30 days before they transition to make them more successful. Cool. So that's currently what I'm doing. Um, there's a lot of other odds and ends, but that's what my focus is right now, is really building relationships. What happens, is there a small smidgen? Of, there's two questions. Number one, is there a small smidgen of people that, what happens if after 90 days, 90 day mark comes and they haven't found a place? So if they are actively really working hard, they're engaged with our housing navigator, um, they're actively involved in Washington County, they attend events, they're being good community partners, they're being good roommates, um, and they're really showing engagement and they're working hard, uh, we provide extensions. Uh, for those individuals that are close to securing housing. The last thing we want to do is um, ruin an opportunity for someone to secure stable housing by making them 
without a, without a shelter, without a home. So we try to provide um, with that criteria um, an extension for those individuals, and we do the best we can um, with um, that extension. And um, since uh, now, what is the percentage of people with special needs that are homeless or not, have, not having housing? And is it a double-edged sword if a person is homeless and disabled? It makes life more difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. um, makes life more difficult for them. And we try to add the extra supports mm -hmm. to get Such them, as? to give them, say, if they need a little more education or a little more support, we'll, we'll try to help them work on that. Um, we advocate very strongly for our guests. And if we see that they can use a little extra help, We'll, we'll try to say somebody is maybe has a, um, a language barrier. Yes. We'll hook them up with some English as a second language classes. Or if someone's lacking education, we'll hook them up with the ability to gain maybe their GED or whatever they need from the adult education programs. Mm -hmm. We try to hook people up with the services. We can't, we can't reinvent the wheel and do all of that, but we try to hook them up with the services that are available in the community. And there's lots of services for people available. Mm -hmm. And we also try to keep a relationship active with Washington County. So we meet with them um, at least weekly. We have our um, a staff that actually comes in and uh, he, he's a therapist, so he'll assist people with regulation and, and, and just an open ear to have a conversation with. But we also have regular uh, meetings with Washington County um, to talk about what are their services that they offer. We talk about individuals um, around a table to say, how can we as a group uh, best serve this person that's <coughs> struggling with mental health issues? Um, can they can they be, because of their mental health issues, can they get case management? Can they um, be screened for one of our CSP vouchers where that would provide a case manager in the household for those individuals? So we collaborate a lot with mm -hmm. uh, Washington County and our partners to figure out how we can best serve a wraparound program for mm -hmm. the individuals that may be struggling with some homelessness and some mental health. Now, as far as services and programming, um, I understand that Good Samaritan, um, uh, you know, you guys provide meals mm -hmm. to people, um, you know, within the house, within the shelters. How does that work? Is it completely donation or how does it Work. We are extremely blessed, I feel, to have the support of so many wonderful people. We get, almost every night of the week, we get a meal donated. Um, and when you're cooking for 30 people, that's a lot of mouths to feed. So, you know, we have a couple of families who do it. We have a good number of churches who collaborate on bringing, bringing meals. Someone will do the main course, someone will do the dessert, someone will bring the salad, you know, things like that. Um, and we have a lot of meals that come in. I also have, through Vermont Associates Senior Employment Training Program, a wonderful man who's my um, food services coordinator. And right now, He's in the shelter cooking up a storm. It smells very good in there right now. Boiled dinner. Um, <laughs> he's making food for Saturday night for the men who live at the heading shelter, Saturday and Sunday night for the people who live at the Bethany shelter, and Sunday night for the people who live at Good Samaritan Haven. That poor man has his work cut out for him today. Mm -hmm. But without him doing that, it would be more difficult. We get lots of food donated. People just will drop off what they think we might need, or they'll call and Brownies ask. Brownies or food. Yeah, or bags of coffee. Um, you know, whatever people think we might be able to use, they drop off. And that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper, detergent, yes. all of that. Mm -hmm. all, the all, stuff. all of the above. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't want to forget, I don't want to cut you off, but Judy also had set up this year. Um, Heading has extended hours this year, and in the past we've struggled with how do we feed these individuals because there's no meal provided in the community for those folks. So Judy advocated 
um, for a couple of years to get the um, shelter open. So now our, our folks do not have to open at as and we've extended the hours from seven to seven. Yes. Uh, in the past, it was um, nine to seven, and there was a two hour there was a two hour gap uh, from when the library nine a.m. It's nine. It, it's seven. It's seven p.m. Seven, 7. p.m. Mm -hmm. to seven a.m. is when the shelter heading shelters open. At Heading Church. Uh, in the past, it used to be open only from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., and that gave um, that was kind of a struggle because the library would shut uh, close down at 7, and that's where the majority of our overflow folks will stay to be warm. So that uh, left a two hour window for folks being out in the elements before they were able to seek uh, warmth. So Judy fought for, for many years to get that open. So now we uh, and the have the Montpelier shelter as well. The Montpelier shelter is open Sit. from 8. From it's from it's from eight to eight thirty. Oh, it's from eight thirty to eight. Eight to eight thirty. Eight to eight thirty. Yeah, 830. because yes. city council, yeah. from what I understand, city council of Montpelier fought with you. Well, not fought, but like helped with the help Supported. of you guys. Got, gave support to open up the shelter. I think a week early or two. It was actually two, two weeks early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They and they this. They donated the money mm -hmm. to make that possible. But we, we now have 77 beds of shelter, mm -hmm. and they're all full. Mm -hmm. And we keep getting calls. Every day we get more calls. The need is so huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The need is huge. More and more people are, are looking for shelter. I and understand. It's really difficult. I understand also that Montpelier had, um, Within the city council, they they have a um, homeless task homeless task force. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, how does that work and within the? Whole I have no idea. I don't go to that. <laughs> do you go to that? I don't go to that. No, but I do know that they did work really hard um, on collaborating and making sure that the word got out um, with us and with just uh, because we don't serve all of the under unhoused folks in um, Montpelier. There are still folks that are um, couch surfing uh, or still staying outside in sleeping yeah, bags. So we can't camping. reach all of those folks. So there's been a really and strong... And it's a shame, actually. It is a shame. Mm -hmm. um, but the, to the Homeless Task Force did a really great job at getting out the word to those folks uh, of the meals that would be provided around the holidays. So they did a really great um, job on collaborating, creating a couple flyers um, that they could pass out to individuals that we, we, we provided our, our guests that information, but they got out there, they went out, they went out and um, went and did outreach and provided the information to mm -hmm. ensure that everyone was aware of where they could get a warm meal around the holidays. So they've, I think they've done a great job at working together with us. really doing an amazing yep. job mm -hmm. trying to support yep. homeless people. Yep. Yeah, and it's just, um, it takes a do, you know the, do you guys know the numbers <clears throat> or do you know... Um, a little bit about the numbers of how many homeless people there are in in Vermont per se because I know those numbers change they change and it's hard to capture because we're not it, there are again there's you can't a huge be in everywhere. you will and some of our some of the folks refuse to um, uh, provide us that information for us to capture. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of outreach um, in, in tents and things of that nature, but they don't always want to mm -hmm. engage. So we can't capture the actual number unless they are willing to, um, we utilize a um, homeless uh, HMIS system. And Which it's is a, what? It is a homeless management information system. And it's a database where we, all the uh, <coughs> homeless shelters in Vermont that um, do an intake process, they will actually upload their information. So we're able to have numbers and create numbers of actual homelessness through that database. But if we're not reaching those folks that do not want to engage, there's a, from what I hear, there's a large population of individuals that are still unhoused, homeless, that we, we, we can't even grasp the numbers. So we do the best we can with folks that engage, um, and we can get an accurate number of those individuals. But I think it's a larger, a larger percentage of people mm -hmm. than we um, can print out with a report. Yeah. Okay. And they have this um, report is done once a year, and I believe it's nationwide, and it's called the point in time mm -hmm. count or the pit count. Mm -hmm. And they try to capture everyone who's homeless, and then they can, you know, publish a report. Last year was not a freezing cold night. 
so there were less people counted. So it makes it look like homeless is going down. And you said freezing cold night. Explain what you mean. It wasn't. It people. Some people were out. They they didn't go and say the motel stays are counted in the point in time count. Mm -hmm. But if it's not really really cold, people are not going to get a hotel stay. I wanted to bring that up. I, I know that um, there's a wonderful agency within Barry, Vermont. Economic services, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> sometimes they they get they don't consider uh, uh, you really homeless if you're in a hotel. Let's say you have to pay out of your own pocket, but sometimes economic services would give, or in the past they have given twenty eight day stays or a month stay, mm -hmm. and, and you're considered homeless. You are if you're oh. staying in a motel paid for by economic services, but, which is statewide, Yes. Um, if you're paying on your own, you're not considered homeless. That's, that, that's my point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but has that changed since all of these shelters have opened? Are not, motel stays I think more? motel stays are down. Down, yeah. Yes. And that was the idea of the funding being given to emergency shelters, the number of emergency shelters got that funding so they could open up the winter warming shelters. Mm -hmm. And um, it's still, there's still a lot of homeless still a people. Problem. It's still, still a, a lot of homeless people. Okay. Um, place where people can turn for help at Good Samaritan. Well, they can call us. Is that, is that what you're yes. asking? Yeah. They can either stop by or they can call us. We're at 105 North Seminary Street in Barrie. Mm -hmm. Or they can call 802-479-2294. Mm -hmm. Someone there pretty much 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. Yep. And what are the hours of the shelter in there? Um, the night shelter opens at 3 in the afternoon because after daylight savings time, it's dark by four, and we didn't want people walking in ice and snow in dangerous conditions in the dark. So we open earlier and we close at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. But say today, it was only like one or minus one. Minus one. So we didn't send people out in the cold. Yeah. And so you um, make exceptions. We for do the make rule. exceptions based on the weather. Mm -hmm. Yep. And one of our guests made breakfast for everybody, <laughs> which uh, is really nice. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, future goals of Good Samaritan going forward? Ending homelessness. Mm -hmm, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, housing it, folks. We were supposed to end it in 2020. Is there an extension of that? Well, that was kind of the dream mm -hmm. of a group called Vermont Interfaith Action. And it was called the 2020 Vision. And they wanted... The vision was to end homelessness by 2020. No. It didn't really happen, but they're working on it, and they're, there's good people really working hard to end homelessness. Mm -hmm. We'd like to all be out of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's probably not going to happen very soon. Okay. Um, homelessness is, last question, homelessness is a global issue, not mm -hmm. just local. Yes. Right. What are some things that America should work on, or the nation should work on in terms of homelessness. I know compassion is mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Compassion is huge. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding, being understanding of people's situations. Um, I, I would love there to be more single room occupancies. Mm -hmm. And what where is that? Single room occupancies are where like say a room in a rooming house mm -hmm. where someone can have their own bed and maybe share a bathroom or have their own bathroom, Transitional share housing. a kitchen. Um, would that be, would, would well, that be I don't think it would be, it would be, it would be considered permanent housing. And lots of the big cities have taken over hotels mm -hmm. and turned them into single room occupancy. Yeah. And when I was at um, in DC, um, the um, some of the 
some of the bigger agencies were opening up single room occupancies. And I think they're good because they give people community and support in addition to a place to live. They're not out there in their very own apartment all by themselves. They still need to go into a, um, a shared kitchen and a shared dining room mm -hmm. and maybe eat with other people and not That's feel hard so sometimes alone. When you, yeah. Those things are hard yeah. when you have to be with other people. Yeah. But it also can make it easier mm -hmm. because there's other people there to support you and you're not just all alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, it's, it's so many layers in what can be done to end homelessness. And if people were committed mm -hmm. to working on those layers, I think it might happen. Your opinion on that? I would say a combination of um, empathy and unbias. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of bias around um, homelessness and, and how people have gotten themselves unhoused. I think there's a real strong unaccurate um, bias of why people are homeless. And blame placing. Yep. And so I think that if oh, we, yeah. I think if we could get past that, um, and just remember that these individuals are actually human beings at the end of the day. Um, and then that's just, the, that's just the humanity piece of it. But we have all kinds of options and affordable options to solving homelessness. Um, I love that Washington County just released their first um, tiny home um, as, a, a temp, as a solution ish um, in the area for um, and also unhoused. Norwich University they contributed the small house that, the uh, tiny as house well, yeah. so uh, that's a cost effective way to house folks mm -hmm. uh, we have houses that are empty we have spaces in downtown Barrie that are empty that can be used as places to keep folks warm there are many many solutions um, I just feel like it needs to um, it needs to be addressed and kind of not brushed under the rug. I think a lot of people um, pretend like it's not a crisis. And um, being homeless, uh, does it, I mean, sometimes homeless people um, or people that are homeless would go into an unhab, I think I'm saying it right, an unhabitable situation mm -hmm. or a building that's been condemned to try to live there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's not good either. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's not safe. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. yeah. And the people who own the building usually don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But if they would fix their building up and rent it out mm -hmm. so people could afford it, that might be a partial solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I would like to thank you oh, thank for you. joining me on this edition of um, Abled and On Air. And for more information on Good Samaritan Haven, you can go to www.goodsamaritanhaven.org or, um, or call 1-802-222-2222. Uh, That's 479-2294. Again, www.goodsamaritanhaven.org. Again, um, I'm Lawrence Seiler, and this puts an end. This is this edition of Able Done On Air. <coughs> Able Done On Air. We would like to thank our um, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services. Again, Arlene couldn't be here today. See you next time on this edition of Able Done On Air. And also, um, we would like to also thank our sponsor, um, Ala Israel, as well. Thank you, and good day. Major support for Able Done On Air. Green Mountain Support Services. To empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Allah Israel. All people, no limits. <laughs>